Okay. All right, well, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome everybody. Um, uh, this session is uh, uh, part of the uh, Central Virginia chapter of CSI um, monthly programming that we do, uh, particularly since we cannot meet in person these days. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and I certainly hope that you get some value out of uh, out of being on the uh, uh, on the seminar, and uh, maybe see some value out of uh, joining the organization as well. Um, our speaker today is Kurt Lukey. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, 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 design in floodplains. Uh, uh, construction techniques and impacts on flood insurance that uh, that go with all of that. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to shut up since none of you wants to listen to me anyway, and uh, and let Kurt have the floor. So go for it, Kurt. Thank you, Ray, and uh, appreciate the invite and being able to speak to you all today. Um, the first slide pretty much is, encompasses a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we have a very diverse group, which is excellent. Uh, we have city town represented here, government. We have architectural firms, civil engineering. Uh, so again, any questions, you know, just jump in. It's a very informal uh, process. So happy to answer questions as we move forward. So the company itself, floodproofing.com, is a manufacturer and supplier of flood mitigation solutions, probably the largest one-stop shop for finding the latest and greatest uh, advancements that are occurring in flood mitigation uh, product solutions. Uh, so it's always kind of nice to stay on the cutting edge uh, and be able to look at what's going on on the wet flood proofing side, dry flood proofing, um, and of course, you know, flood windows and impact products. So the um, program, as I've mentioned, is... Um, going to be AIA accredited. Uh, here's my contact information. I'll show the slide again at the base. Um, I'm a CFM for those that don't uh, recognize the acronym. Basically, I'm a certified floodplain manager. So in many cases, a lot of you interact with your floodplain administrators. Uh, in many cases, they're also CFMs as well. So all that is, is we are students of everything. FEMA, NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program, uh, as well as ASCE 24, 14, and 7, as it relates to um, IRC IBC code uh, that you'll be working through. So when you're working in a floodplain or special flood hazard area, or another word would be 100 year chance of flood area, um, you know, these are areas of expertise and pretty much the sandbox of where we'll be playing in today. So, Companies basically started off on the wet flood proofing side, uh, initially uh, introduced the first engineered flood opening. We'll break that down for you in the presentation. Uh, also has a diverse uh, line card on all the latest and greatest dry flood proofing. And when I say wet flood proofing, for those that don't understand the terms, basically what we're doing is if you have a foundation or enclosure that exists below the base flood line, that's established by FEMA. Those enclosures um, need to be wet flood proof, meaning they have to have openings designed into the foundation or enclosure that cover 100% of the outside dimension of that enclosure. And each device has its own coverage. We'll break that down. But also it equalizes pressure against the foundation, basically alleviating hydrostatic load. On the dry flood proofing side, this is limited to your commercial, non-residential projects that you'll take on. And these are various products that can be deployed manually or passively that will keep water completely out of the structure. So if you need to utilize space below the base flood line on a commercial project, in many cases, you're faced with dry flood proofing techniques in your design. Um, the team itself in-house, uh, we have a full plans division. So one of the reasons we uh, are speaking today is obviously to introduce the company as a resource. Everything we do is complementary, uh, both for government as well as architects and engineers and civil. 
if you're working in a special flood hazard area, we collaborate. Uh, so we can take a look at your designs, do a full plan review assessment, make recommendations and find uh, the best solutions uh, for those mitigation application needs. So the team, all our engineers are also CFMs and we even have an insurance division. Uh, that division basically provides ROI baseline analysis for your project to see if there's an impact on how you're designing it as far as what they will pay ultimately in flood insurance on the property. So with that being said, we uh, recently brought on a new sister company um, and that company is specializing in specialty window systems. This is another educational program that's available for y'all. Um, the company is producing the very first certified FM Global flood window on the market today. All tested to ANSI 2510 standards and FM Global certification. So some great advancements in uh, oversized glass, um, 468 square feet of glass and any encumbrance within, impact structural glass, even flood walls made of glass. So a lot of fun stuff going on in the uh, specialty window category as well. We'll touch a little bit on it today. So as I mentioned, the course qualifies for AIA. Um, there's a uh, link at the end of the presentation that you'll go to to register. As you register, if you have an AIA number, you'll be prompted to add it. Regardless of whether you add an AIA number or not, when you exit, you will be emailed a certificate with your name on it and uh, that you completed the course. If you enter an AIA number during the registration process, it automatically registers you for the course. So it takes away that uh, extra burden. So today we're gonna to be talking about design and construction within uh, a floodplain, as I mentioned earlier, touching on wet and dry techniques and solutions available. Go in depth on the wet and dry side regarding engineered, non-engineered openings on wet, and of course, active and passive systems on the dry side. And then of course, making sure that we're fully compliant um, within all FEMA and ASCE regulations. These are the documents we're pulling information from today. Um, obviously, the lower left-hand corner is the brand new TB1, FEMA's Technical Bulletin 1, basically addresses all requirements for wet flood proofing. Um, then we have FEMA TB2 to the right of that, dealing with obviously everything that you design below the base flood line needs to be designed with flood resistant material requirements, things we all know about already. Uh, the third document in from the left deals with everything uh, with regard to dry flood proofing regulations. And that's obviously for your commercial non-residential uh, structures. And then all three of those documents, including more have been uh, fully adopted into ASCE 24 and either written into or referenced back to from your current IRC and IBC code books. So some basic terms, um, base flood elevation line, Again, this is the FEMA mapping system, the A zone areas that are mapped, uh, that are the 100% uh, one year chance of, or 100 year, 1% 1 chance of flood that occurs and FEMA maps to uh, nationally. Uh, design flood elevation, you're gonna hear this term. What's the difference between DFE and BFE? Well, the design flood elevation takes into consideration freeboard. Freeboard is a higher standard in the industry where we're looking at taking the lowest living floor, which normally is designed at the BFE line, the base flood elevation, and we're adding additional footage and we're raising it up, plus one, plus two, plus three feet. Um, basically, the higher you go, the more impact it's gonna have on reducing the client's flood insurance. One foot of freeboard, added to the base flood line for the lowest floor, will decrease flood insurance over 52% per year. It's enormous. So if you're working in or near a floodplain, it always behooves you to make a recommendation to the clients. Go ahead and add another foot, foot and a half. Uh, by the way, FEMA does round up. So a foot and a half would equate out to two feet of freeboard. 
And a lot of communities have already adopted some of these. So in so much as I'd like to say there's a national standard uh, for flood mitigation and elevations, there isn't. Ordinances vary by township. So you always wanna check with your local AHJ authority having jurisdiction to make sure you're designing to their standard because they can regulate higher standards and flood or excuse me, free board is just an example of that. There's also a new uh, zone that you're gonna see on some of the newer maps revisions and that's the, the coastal A zone. It's kind of illustrated in the video down below. It's really taken a zone V, which is your coastline, your high risk areas, okay? And the V zones from a design standpoint, you're basically putting everything up on piers, okay? Elevating well above uh, the flood risk, okay? And you're limited to enclosure size in the V zone. So if you put an enclosure below that uh, structure, you're limited to 299 square feet and the access for that structure, it needs to be constructed. The walls need to be constructed with breakaway wall systems and they also need to be vented as well. As you move inland, you're using the same design techniques through coastal A zones. This is where you're looking at a limb wall or limited wave action line of about three feet. Um, and you're designing the same way up on piers. If you do an enclosure, you're limited. As you move into A zones, this is an area where again, you're going to change only in where you identify that lowest living floor. And again, starting at BFE, unless there's additional ordinances for higher standards. The X zone is your highest elevation, as you see illustrated here in the back. Believe it or not, that's where 80% of the damage is occurring during severe weather conditions. Um, so anyone building in or near an A zone and they're in an X zone, they're not regulated for flood insurance, but they really should have it. And if they're designing something new or substantial improvement, they really should add another foot or two to elevation uh, in those areas because those zones, example, Hurricane Harvey, over 60% of the damage due to Hurricane Harvey was in the X zone areas. And again, there's multiple examples of that nationally. So keep in mind uh, from a recommendation standpoint, so wet flood proofing is the first technique that we'll probably go into, but what's happening during flood events is the hydrostatic and hydrodynamic forces that occur during a flood. Hydrostatic, obviously we're dealing with pressures up against the foundation. Uh, FEMA's determined that 12 inches or more of water can start to crack, heave, or displace a foundation based on duration of flood, okay? Subgrade enclosures are frowned upon and regulated in many communities, so always check uh, in those areas. But there's additional forces uh, fighting against those wall lines as well. So again, the wet flood proofing, we want to get water inside that structure, inside that enclosure to equalize that pressure. Now FEMA, from their perspective, leans on the design community to solve all the problems you see here. So no pressure. But uh, there is no one type of flood you're designing against. You're designing against all of them. So with that in mind, um, the considerations that you have available to you uh, start off with the wet flood proofing method. Again, that's where we're introducing devices in and around the foundation. Uh, the regulations per FEMA are based on the device's coverage capability, and that's how many square feet it will cover. You have to cover 100% of the OD of the enclosure in the floodplain. And you can only install those devices no higher than 12 inches off the highest adjacent grade, whether interior or exterior, to the bottom of those openings. And as you can see, there's multiple uh, variations available. There's multi-frame products, all sorts of fun things to work with. But the main thing that really impacts the client is gonna be, if I put these devices in, does it impact my flood insurance? The answer is absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna show you a quick case study uh, of ins insurance impact just to kind of give you a feel. It varies nationally, but uh, if you have anything specific you need looked at, our insurance division is always available to support. So in this case, we have a property that was elevated uh, right off the Illinois River. 
Uh, their initial premium subsidized was about $2,000. The reason it was so high and it was going to continue to rise to a $9,000 actuarial rate over a four year period, due primarily because when they elevated it, they didn't do anything to alleviate the pressure in the foundation. So the insurance industry at that point sees the foundation at risk and lowers the lowest living floor to the bottom of that enclosure. By doing so, it drops it below the BFE line of 460 by nine feet, making it a negative nine rated property. And hence, at higher risk equals higher insurance. Even though the architect designed it properly, it is a plus one. It's actually the lowest living floor is one foot above. So by introducing the proper coverage and ventilation into that enclosure to equalize pressure, it was able to impact the overall cost of that insurance policy dramatically. So again, as they activate, which they did during the flood, you can see them and how they work. Again, these are engineered openings. We're also gonna cover non-engineered options as well, but just to kind of give you a feel. So the insurance advantage, again, overall, a huge savings, um, went from 2000 down to about $511 per year. So keep in mind, some of these design changes will impact the client in the long-term. So ROI baseline analysis is always helpful. So what types of enclosures do you have to design uh, for wet flood proofing? Residential or commercial, you have the option to use wet flood proofing. Again, you're covering 100% of the enclosed area and installing minimum of two walls of that four wall enclosure. You have to have entry and exit points. And again, installed no higher than 12 inches off the highest adjacent grade. And the goal again is to alleviate that hydrostatic pressure and using a proper opening, one that opens to an unobstructed opening, in many cases is gonna be superior to what we call a non-engineered opening that has a fixed closed area, a screen, grills, um, base plates, et cetera. As it slows down the entry of water, if you start to exceed 12 inches of water without relief against the foundation, they consider an engineered opening failing at that point. So they are performance tested, never to exceed 12 inches of delta from exterior to interior flood water levels. And again, the reason for that they feel that 12 inches or more water put the foundation at risk. So they want to alleviate that issue. Bringing in fill, uh, we touched a little bit on it on the sidebar, uh, but again, one of the options some developers will use is bringing fill into a development to elevate the properties above the base flood line. Um, if it's not regulated, this is obviously an option, but it is frowned upon by the AFSPM, bringing in fill offsets area that would normally occupy, be occupied by flood water. So now we're pushing that cubic feet of water somewhere else. In many cases on a commercial project, if you're developing commercial in a floodplain and you're considering fill, you'll need to bring in a third party hydrology firm to do a study to show the impact of your project on the community's floodplain uh, area. Obviously you can have zero increase in scope or size and the summary would have to reflect that for the project to probably move forward. So fill is an option, not referred to as a positive in so much as putting a foundation and wet flood proofing in many cases is more, can be more cost effective and also allow the space to still be used to occupy the water that was there. So the basics of a vent itself, as I mentioned, there's two different kinds, engineered, non-engineered. Um, it's designed again to alleviate the load. It needs to be bi-directional, meaning water has to be able to get in and get out, okay? And all the details you'll need from a design standpoint are gonna be illustrated in FEMA's new TB1. So here's two different types, a non-engineered opening is illustrated here on the left. The uh, device is probably recognizable to most of you. 
it's an air vent. Okay. Back in the day, this is all they had. Okay. And air vents come and are identified in new TV one as devices without moving parts. They're considered non-engineered openings. So if you approach a structure and it's got something like this in it, it has fixed louvers, blades, screens, grills, or face plates, it's considered non-engineered, and it's limited to a coverage formula established in FEMA TV1. And basically that's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, for every one square inch of net open space on the device, it will cover one square foot of the enclosure. So most of these air vents cover about 40 to 45 square inches of opening, therefore covering the same in square footage. So the math will work out and I'll show you an example here in a minute. An engineered opening is now defined as a flood opening with moving parts, meaning the device on the right, the door actually releases and opens and opens to an unobstructed opening. So non-engineers, again, what we all started with, but there have been huge advancements on the engineered side and most likely higher standards will eventually establish engineered openings as, as the true standard. So non-engineered, non means not, engineered means designed. These vents are not designed for flood, they're designed for airflow. So keep in mind, they're limited, and the, one of the biggest reasons they're limited is because they can clog. And part of the one-to-one -one ratio for coverage, there's a factor in the formula that addresses flow rate. And this is where the flow can be negatively impacted. So any shape that's partially obstructed, meaning non-engineered, gets a coefficient of discharge or flow rate of 0.2. Everything else in table 2.2 and ASCE shows higher flow rates, but for unobstructed openings only, based on their shape and the fact that they're all unobstructed. So as it can be clearly stated, the more open that space is, the faster the water's gonna enter, the quicker it's gonna equalize, and the ability for it to exceed 12 inches at any point in time is diminished dramatically. So measuring that again is very basic. And coverage in itself, if you were looking at a footprint of about 1,200 square feet and you were looking at using a non-engineered opening, you're probably looking at almost 30 units in the uh, foundation. If you're looking at an engineered device, depending on its coverage, the one illustrated down here covers about 200 square feet per device because it opens and you'd only need six of those. If you wanna know what's acceptable, not acceptable, you can go to TB1. Uh, page 28, it illustrates uh, a lot of things that are considered unacceptable. And of course, windows and garages by themselves and even side doors by themselves are not flood openings. We, if you can though, you can introduce a flood opening into them. There is specific garage door and side door product available. So you can utilize that space if you don't have a wall surface that you can work with, you can move to the garage door or side door areas and introduce them. So as I mentioned earlier, on the non-engineered side, this is the one thing that really jumps out, the clogging capability. And if it becomes clogged and it exceeds 12 inches of delta, it puts the foundation at risk. The uh, Hurricane Harvey I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the examples of where the ordinances are changing is down in Houston. Uh, they have now eliminated the use of non-engineered openings in their city ordinance. So as I say, keep in mind and keep an eye out. To give you an idea of what products are available to you, there are multitudes of products out there. Uh, these happen to be a stainless steel line 316L marine grade. They have dual function doors that have airflow and flood protection where the whole door opens. They have insulated models, huge advancements on insulating flood openings now. That has an additional accessory that goes on the interior and the combination of that seven inches of wall gap give you an R10 factor for a flood opening, which is unheard of and currently exceeds 2018 energy code. So if you're heating, cooling or conditioning a space that you have to vent, the insulated options are your best solution. 
They have other wood wall designs for 16 inch on center, as I mentioned earlier, door model designs, and even multi-frames if you have to cover a lot of square footage. Uh, those products are available to you as an architect designer. So again, engineered, I mentioned several things on it already, but a picture is always worth a thousand words. So this is some of the performance testing that an engineered opening has to go through. So many cubic feet of debris, three inch debris has to be able to pass through the device. And of course it has to be passive in nature, which means it needs to open by itself, okay? And maintain that 12 inch delta throughout the test performance. And most engineered openings are gonna be ICC evaluated through their evaluation services and receive a certificate. So these are products that are fully backed through the ICCES process, full engineering report to back them up for performance and the fact that they're performance tested, again, elevates them to a higher level for your project. I mentioned earlier about an additional device added to the interior of a flood opening area. Uh, these devices are, were introduced over a year ago. And like I say, provide an airtight seal to that area but will break apart during a flood vent. They have trim product as well, and even fire rated product uh, in this category. So a lot of advancements to support your design needs. Already touched on placement, minimum two walls, no higher than 12 inches. And of course you need to have enough openings to cover the enclosed area based on the openings coverage capability. And commercially, you can wet flood proof as well. And again, because you're covering larger square feet, you can double stack, triple stack these products. Uh, they're available in custom designs, even powder coated um, as a stainless steel product so they can meet any aesthetics you might be faced with. And because they're 316L marine grade, they can even be installed straight stainless. So you've got a lot of flexibility. And again, on the commercial side, this is just another example, community center, uh, that introduced these to meet their uh, ASE standards and shows them active. Okay, any questions on wet flood proofing? I'm gonna move into dry now. Okay, shoot them out if you've got them, happy to answer. So, I mentioned earlier what dry flood proofing is. Again, it's a method available to you as a designer to be able to protect areas that you want to occupy the space, but you wanna be able to protect that space against flood. And this again is limited to commercial application, so non-residential only. And there's a multitude of products in this category uh, that can help support your design needs. So dry flood proofing, you're going to find a lot of information in Technical Bulletin 393, also Technical Bulletin P936. P936 is your newer document, but it details uh, everything that you want to know from a design standpoint and the requirements behind it. I'm going to outline some of those as we go through the presentation. The use of dry flood proofing, though, is limited to the A zones. So you're unable to utilize this on the coastal areas, your V-zone areas, or your coastal A's. You may be able to get some type of waiver support there in coastal A's, but for the most part, you're limited to the A-zone area uh, for dry flood proofing. Um, ASCE recognizes, again, everything in those technical bulletins. Uh, you can reference it all in 2414 and ASCE 7. Um, and we're going to touch on a lot of these kind of requirements just to highlight some of the things you need to pay attention to in this area. So ASCE, you'll find flood proofing, dry flood proofing sections starting out in section six. And obviously it's going to introduce the description of what you're doing. Obviously, you're basically um, developing a process that's going to watertight the structure, make it impermeable to water entering into the structure. There is always gonna be some seepage, uh, but there's a limit to the amount of seepage that can occur. So based on your product selection for your project, you're trying to achieve no more than four inches of water over a 24 hour period during a flood event. And there'll be some other restrictions as well. 
these are some of the other things that we're going to be doing as architects. Uh, we're looking at the fact that we're going to introduce a periodic inspection and maintenance program when we submit. We're also going to be developing an emergency evacuation and inspection plan when you submit. So whatever product comes along with that, you'll get that support obviously from the manufacturer, but you will be introducing emergency evacuation and inspection plans for the products, how you're going to deploy it, who's going to deploy it, the time frame, et cetera, because you're limited from notification of flood to only 12 hours to deploy the system. So based on your client's resources, equipment, personnel, you'll determine which product's going to fit the project the best. Okay. One of the other things that you'll be faced with is completing the FEMA flood proofing certificate. Uh, this is normally required uh, by the city. Uh, so you're going to be looking at projects utilizing dry flood proofing. Uh, either the engineer of record or a structural engineer will actually complete this cert certification, basically evaluating that the structure, number one, the envelope can handle the loads based on the flood risk level that you're faced with. So they're certifying that. If it's new construction, they're also certifying any additional water treatment, uh, water resistant treatment and materials that you may introduce into the wall line. Uh, during construction, those need to be photographed if they're gonna be behind the wall, but it needs to be fully documented and added to this document that it shows that you completed the, ins the installation properly and to the proper standards. Again, emergency operation plan, inspection maintenance plan will accompany this document as well. And this folder goes to two people, it goes to the client. It also goes for CO with the city. So ultimately the client is gonna get it uh, and benefit by sharing it with their insurance company because it just validates what they did to make sure the structure was properly protected against flood for the insurance company, and it will benefit them in the long term on what they pay for flood insurance. Proper installation is always gonna be critical. So if you're uh, providing any guidance on the installation side, dealing with uh, people that are qualified with the product, have installed it in the past is critical. You always wanna make sure that it's not just a purchase of material, but that you're getting a professional installation as well. They have experience in this category. Turnkey flood protection services is something that we really uh, tout a lot of. Um, our company provides both material and installation capability information. So if you're looking for uh, assessments that carry both, this is something that uh, we believe firmly in. Always go with a manufacturer that can support the install as well. So what's some of the solutions out there? Um, one of the first ones we want to touch on is a perimeter system. Uh, if you're familiar with perimeter systems, basically we're building a wall. We're going to put it all the way around a structure or along a riverine or up against a levee or uh, a lot of different things that these products can be used for. But ultimately, we're creating an enclosure with these uh, systems that keeps water completely out. The goal is to eliminate sandbags. Uh, sandbags, again, being kind of the non-engineered opening of uh, dry flood proofing. Everybody wants to go to a sandbag. If you've ever priced a, the life cycle of a sandbag, you'll realize that in many cases, there are reusable products out there that are cheaper than the price of sandbags. The example here uh, is a four foot high wall, six feet long. A comparable unit next to it is half the price of those sandbags. They average anywhere from $3.50 to $5 per bag when you consider time, labor, material, and disposal. Because after a flood event, these need to be scooped and sent to a hazard waste facility for disposal. They should not be disposed of in a standard landfill because, again, the bacteria and uh, other uh, chemicals that could be absorbed into them during a flood event. 
So the introduction of perimeter systems, there's a multitude of products in this category. Uh, this just happens to be one uh, example, but it's used for flood control, containment, stormwater management, even crossing roads. What's unique about it is it's hollow, lightweight, but strong industrial PVC design. When filled with water, they hold 1,650 pounds. Uh, they have a tow design uh, that basically has a liner that goes over the top of it and then is basically clamped onto that uh, unit. They can come off of buildings, so they can be an extension of a building, they can surround structures, they can be floated into an existing flood area and sank and then water pumped out behind them. Uh, they have a lot of options available to them. But a lot of public works departments utilize this product for flood protection. In many cases, they leave them out 24 seven and they just bring a liner out when there's a flood event. The picture in the upper left-hand corner is Battery Park in New York. And again, these systems are in play 24 seven and liners are the only thing that come out during the event. There's a lot of different liner setups. Is there a question? Okay. There's a lot of different wrapping processes uh, that can be done based on the permanent or temporary deployment of it. It's even used for erosion control uh, and, of course, hazmat containment areas for spray offs, etc. So these systems, because of their weight and strength, really provide a lot of solutions. This is another one that's new to the industry. Um, it's a one piece fold up wall. This system literally zips together like a Yeti cooler. Double zip system, lightweight, industrial PVC design, standalone corners, can come off of a structure uh, and basically handles the sealing process by the weight of the water down on its apron. So again, these systems are lightweight, they can roll out, uh, be stored very easily, basically power washed off. The piping breaks apart. It's threaded with stainless steel cabling. And again, there's anchor points front and back. So you can have that set up around any infrastructure that you've got. And this product, we've even seen a lot of residential applications. So full perimeter systems in this category, uh, again, for people to be able to easily handle, carry out, and set up is a lot of advantages in this particular arena. There's also um, collapsible perimeter systems. Uh, this kind of goes along the same line as a HESCO uh, system. I'm sure you've seen them at the military level. HESCO is filled with sand. Uh, they produce a barrier solution. There are PVC liners in each individual cage attached to each other and can provide erosion control and perimeter uh, protection as well. The difference in this system is instead of sand, which can be very costly, cumbersome, and time consuming, these units are filled with water. And again, providing the same type of protection and impact capabilities. So again, the cages are simple, can fit in the back of a pickup truck, fold out, liners are put into play, and then water added. One of the things that tends to get overlooked during the design phase is all dry systems can seep or they could fail during a flood event. And part of the requirements from ASCE is that you provide a backup sump system uh, for any areas that are protected with dry flood proofing. So keep in mind when you're designing that those areas need to have a French drain backing or something where to capture any seepage coming from those doorways, windows, garage entrances, et cetera, and basically seeps into a system that can pump out. There are FM global approved systems uh, available, highly recommend them because again, they're designed uh, to move flood waters and obviously the debris that can exist. So keep that in mind when you're selecting. 
Another one that's very common, this is one that's probably the most uh, known would be what we call a flood log. And the flood logs themselves are been around for a long time. The systems are aluminum. The logs are usually anywhere from eight to 10 inches in, in uh, width. And the problem we deal with in many cases here is that the log itself is heavy. There are about eight pounds per square. Most of the other systems I showed you are less than five. And when you're dealing with them, they have a limit to the length before you have to introduce what we call mid posting. So the mid posting is usually 10 to 12 feet <clears throat> high. And then we introduce something to support it as you see here on the picture on the left. The logs have gaskets above and below. You simply slide them in and then compress them down. The only issue that we have in this case is there's a lot of parts and pieces. It takes a lot of manpower, especially if you're deploying the channels and the end posts, uh, as well as the logs themselves. If you're able to leave the logs out, you're basically able to uh, maintain probably savings of maybe 50, 60% of install time if those channels are left out around the structure and all you have to do is bring the logs out. So these systems, again, been around for a long time. Um, they can be used to any height, any length. Uh, we see a lot of uh, downtown areas around rivers and such utilizing these products to protect uh, the townships inside. So again, reinforcement in this category, pretty stable. This is just a quick video to kind of give you a feel for some of that deployment. They can be put on top of walls, existing walls to extend if you have sea level rise issues and you want to extend a little bit further. But your large commercial projects, this is going to come to play very well for you. So another one that's new to the marketplace out there is a product, um, as you see here, it's a composite material. It's kind of challenging that stop log approach in utilizing panels instead of logs. Um, you're dealing with a composite material that's lightweight, less than five pounds per square, and it can be spliced together and broken down into smaller pieces. So a storage area is an issue. These can be broken down to fit various storage areas. Um, because they're lightweight, they're easy to deploy. But what's really interesting is that black material that you see on the exterior is a military grade ballistic gel coat that uh, they put on the front of icebreaker ships. So that can handle a 7,000 PSI impact. If I put two coats on there, you can go ballistic on that product. There's a closed cellular foam network behind the panel that seals against the structure. There are stainless steel epoxied anchor points that are part of the uh, wall line that they attach to. And basically there's a stainless steel screw that occupies that space until you need to deploy the product. The stainless steel screws can even be powder coated to match the exterior. So again, splines together, lightweight, easy deployment and can address a lot of issues uh, in and around an area and at a reduced cost. These products are usually uh, lower cost than your stop log systems and the advancements in their new toolless design, meaning no tools required to deploy the system is really kind of a fan favorite. Um, in this case, you remove the screws, you put in a bolt and a knob with a washer, and in this case, you just spin the knob and squeeze it against the structure. So very intuitive design solution, lightweight, easy to handle. And due to its strength, you can even cantilever off a half wall and protect window areas above a half wall without attaching to the windows. 
The example in the upper left-hand corner is, is just that. Uh, those panels protecting that storefront are cantilevered off of that lower half wall. Then there's standard products, standard for a single or double door. Uh, this is a unique product made with a fabric material that's patented, um, used to be NASA spacesuit material, and FM Global certified as well. But in this case, similar to that panel I showed you earlier, these also attach. Uh, instead of having a knob design, it's bolted to the structure. And you do not have to bolt to the pavement. As long as you don't have more than a quarter inch of variation uh, in that pavement area, these have a drop down uh, design at the bottom, just basically slips down, and then you can compress it against the lower pavement. So, its advantage is if you have level surface, that you can eliminate doing attachments at the base. The same company has a side deploy and a vertical deploy fabric uh, that houses in bunks that are attached to the structure. And again, if your building envelope can handle the load, then devices like this can be attached to the structure and you have point of use storage. So your device is right there. You come out, you open up the bunk, you slide it across and just like a shower curtain, you drop down a skirt and then, of course, at that particular point, the water seeps over the skirt, pressurizing it downward and up against that wall of protection. So this is just a quick video on a deployment of a system like that. This is 12 feet high, 20 feet in length. And again, two people will deploy that system in less than 10 minutes. So they carry a cable across, make a connection, Crank it down and create the shower curtain rod. Everything is pre-threaded in the bunk, so you just swing it out and then you just slide it across. These uh, were designed and developed after Hurricane Sandy, uh, kind of hit ground in 2014. Again, FM Global certified products. Uh, and again, very quick, rapid deployment intuitive in design. And then they just house it, clamp it shut, and then deploy the skirt. The sandbags you see there are just part of the test tank, so you know that. The skirt is weighted with stainless steel microbeads in the edge, and they have anchor points uh, as available as well, depending on the application. Sorry about the dog noise. And done. You can also go vertical, so straight up out of the ground. So if there's a trench, the material can exist in the trench line. Poles laid down in the trench can be lifted up and set into receivers. And then the fabric just lifts up, hooks to the top of those poles, and uh, you're good to go. It's already pre-clamped into the base below. This is a great application for retail. Because again, if they have limited storage capability, that vertical deployment's nice. Then we have passive. If you've never seen a passive system, bingo. There it is. These are flip up designs. There's also wall designs that come straight out of the ground. But if your client doesn't have any personnel or is limited on the ability to deploy a system within that 12 hour window, the use of passive systems becomes the next phase of consideration. So these walls can actually live in a chamber below ground. Um, they have advanced chambers that flood first. And when they hit critical mass, they start to gravitate water flow into that chamber, elevating the wall. The wall is a compressed styrofoam with a ballistic fiberglass gel coat and it basically rises and locks into place. So a lot of products in the passive area as well. And I'm gonna wrap it up uh, with windows and oversized glass systems, huge advancements in this category. Um, obviously structural, ballistic, uh, flood related, natural disaster, all tested to ANSI 2510, 
oversized window systems in excess of 468 square feet. The advantages on considering window systems that are flood related for projects, either existing or new construction, is that you eliminate the double duty. You're going to eliminate the idea of introducing a standard glazed piece of glass and then paying for a protection against that glass. The combination of cost exceeds what the price of a standard flood window is. So it pencils out to just introduce flood windows to the uh, designed flood elevation height and then use standard windows from there up. The testing, as I mentioned before, uh, first ever done. So impact to a thousand pound impact, uh, again, all to ANSI 2510 and FM Global Design Standards. So the idea here is even after a thousand pound impact, you cannot have water seep through the glass. And despite the cracking, the interior interlayers of that system, including a three inch bite frame that's patented and designed, they'll be able to fill that test chamber up to 10 feet of water and have zero seepage on that window. So despite the fact that it fractures with impact, it doesn't fracture and allow water into the uh, structure. So based on time, I'm gonna go ahead and skirt that. Understand this has a lot of uses. Flood walls made of glass due to sea level rise becoming very popular to maintain aesthetics. Uh, structural in between floors. Obviously you can walk on these things and uh, basically bring views, large views from the outside in. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So when it comes to dry flood proofing, again, there's a host of products all based on your clients uh, resources and the building's uh, application needs. So again, happy to support those if you should need them. These are all of the design considerations that go into considering uh, dry flood proofing or hidden costs that you can run into. Again, to get credit for the course, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the course now. I'm happy to answer any of your product specific questions, but take a screenshot of this, uh, www.smartvent.com forward slash education. Uh, go to that site, enter in your personal information. When you close out certificate, if you enter AIA, automatically registers you for the course. So I'll open it up for any questions at this point. I'll leave that up for a while. That was very interesting. Something I didn't know anything about. <laughs> well, there's a few questions in chat. I guess I could kind of walk through that if that would help. And again, we're available as a company. Everything we do is complimentary. We are a resource to support you all out there and help you kind of configure the best solution for your clients. Again, for anything in that flood related area. So Kurt, I posted your email address and your website in the chat early on, and I just posted the smart vent so anybody can click on those, copy them out, and fill them in your browser. No um, worries. If there aren't any questions, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, I do have a hard stop at one o'clock. I got clients signing on to my Zoom account in five minutes. No worries, no worries. It looks like there was just a couple questions on the 12 hour window. That is a, um, a FEMA guidance requirement. Uh, most uh, cities will uh, be looking for that as a solution. So pretty much a standard um, within ASCE as far as requirements in that category. Um, emergency pumps, as I said before, just again, an absolute must if you're doing dry flood proofing, keep that in mind. Again, that's also an ASCE requirement. And I don't think I see anything else. So I think we're good. 
So again, thanks for having us. Appreciate the opportunity, Charles. Ray. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And for all those attending, we do have another session next Wednesday on um, post-COVID life from an OSHA standpoint in office spaces. So that'll also be worth one AIA credit if you're interested, Travis Vance, which a lot of us here in Harrisonburg know, he's gonna give that presentation. He's a lawyer down in Charlotte, but he was very active here in Harrisonburg when he lived here. And then we have a young professionals networking group that meets at next week on Thursday at 7 p.m. So if you have any young folks in the construction industry and you get to define what that term means, um, we meet once a month on Zoom, and we this month we have a presentation uh, on set. Leanne Slattery is giving a presentation on setting personal goals, I think is what her, her session is. Sorry, I don't remember. But we talk for about two hours, and it's always um, very interactive and some really good conversation in that session. Everybody's welcome to attend, regardless of age or experience. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. You bet. Kurt, I sent you the uh, list of who was here so you have everybody's contact information. Great. Again, y'all stay safe out there. All right. Thank you.